Hey guys, Matthew with the Jayo Nation. We are in one place that I have on my list of the favorite places I've ever been to in China. Rarely do I get a chance to revisit. There's so much going on in this country that normally there's just too much new stuff. But we are here with friends. We've got Guelo60 here, who's a YouTuber. We've got Ali Barrett and his and his uh, dad. And then we've got uh, Max and Noel from Mexicano Sin China. So it's an international affair. And a lot of them have not seen the Terracotta Warriors before. So uh, I'm really excited to kind of reintroduce it. And I, I kind of feel like a guide a bit because I remember the first time I just consumed so much new information. I consumed all of the history of this place because I was so excited about it that uh, I'll be able to share it with these guys and maybe hopefully I can give them an ounce of the enthusiasm that I had when I visited here. I came here with my wife Annie and uh, geez I don't think we were there was no Eva at the time there was no wife at the time we were just friends and we were traveling and uh, we came here uh, on the back of a mountain climbing trip as I was training for climbing Mount Everest. The thing that I really like about this place is that the way it was discovered, the way it was found, and the way it's been preserved is really, really quite amazing. Let's just say we're walking on the street right now. Where your feet are hitting, you wouldn't think nothing of it. That was the thought of a man in, in 1974 Oh no, it's okay, it's okay. That was the thought of a man in 1974 who was working as a farmer in this area. And then just just that away, he was drilling a well to look for water. And he's drilling this well and all of a sudden he hits something. And you know it's pretty common to hit rocks and whatnot. But he looks down, this rock has a face on it. And he looks down and he says, this looks like it might be something. So he dug it up, he looked at it, he was just going to chuck it over his shoulder and say keep digging for water but he decided hey maybe somebody would like to know about this so he took it to the government official in the neighborhood and he said hey check this out and the government official said there might just be something there and from that was born the terracotta army we'll talk more about it when we get in the inside but it's a fantastic story of discovery and history and culture in china and we're going to talk all about it a little later the crazy world we live in, first things first, you've got to scan your code. And then your health code will tell you that you've been here, that you're green, that you're not infected. And that's how contact tracing works. Hello. Nice to meet you. Where are you from? Where are you from? Oh, watch it all, watch it all. Oh. Guangdong, Guangdong, Feichang Hadi Difan. Highly high. It's quite, quite, uh, quite complicated compared to last time I was here. COVID makes things all the more interesting. I think this is funny how they, they put these as if there's some massive trouble going to kick off. It tastes like, it's like what they have as football matches, isn't it, in the UK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even have that. Like matches. a control gear, because obviously there's going to be a big kick off at the Terracotta Warriors. Hey, it's holding the shotgun. These uh, Terracotta Warriors are, are like sort of a national treasure. It's, it's just such an interesting thing that's been discovered just outside of my lifetime, just outside. I, I was born in 1979. This place was rediscovered in 1973. But, I mean, it was obviously been around a lot longer than that. Just hasn't been discovered quite yet. But yeah, they got security over here. They've got a bus over here waiting to take people away. I, I, I'm not sure if, if what exactly they're, they're afraid of. People vandalizing or something. Or maybe manipulating or something breaking breaking some sort of rule but they're definitely exhibiting a bit of a show of force i think a bit too much but <laughs> it sure it sure makes it uh makes it interesting first emperor in our history first emperor in our history you know he got his name was ying zheng yeah ying zheng yeah when he was only 39 years old, he unified the whole country. You know, before uh, before his unification, there were uh, seven countries coexist in the region, in the big region, right? So uh, his country is one of the seven. His father, grandfather, great grandfather, last for four, four, five hundred years, 
His family always try to conquer other countries and unify the whole country. But only in his hand, they make it realized. They realize their dream, unify the other six countries, make seven countries all called Qing, right? So Qing is our first China. That's the word China came from. Yeah, so maybe in other languages, Spanish. So how you speak China? China. China. So all similar pronunciation, right? So Qing is our first China. Most certainly a different experience than I came here last time. The weather's different too. I remember when I came with Annie. It was blistering hot, very, very hot. It's busy here. People and people and people and people. People, mountain, people, sea. Now is actually quite a nice day. Overcast, not too hot, not too cold. Although I do like the sun. Basically it's, it's these big buildings here which house and protect the pits where, where all the excavation is taking place. There was a bit of a problem getting us all tickets and getting us all in here. So my energy level has, has dropped slightly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in there and rah, rah, rah. And then I get, get enthusiastic because this place deserves some enthusiasm. Noelia and uh, Maximilian here are Me Mexicanos in China. And it's really, really interesting. They speak Spanish, obviously, and uh, they are really, really friendly. They're constantly going and interacting with locals. If you want to see a couple of really interesting expats from Mexico traveling around China sharing their stories, you can do that right here. Hello. And uh, right here, you, you, they're, they're filming something. You're going to see it on their channel eventually. Hola amigos. Hola amigos. Hola amigos. Hola amigos. Hola amigos. So the guy that put this whole thing together did so about 2200 years ago and he was a pretty influential guy. As a matter of fact, he was very, very influential with regards to Chinese history. Uh, when he was emperor, China was sort of split into seven districts, seven separate spaces. What he did is he unified all seven together and in, in unifying them, he was able to kind of also do things that would spread across all of the provinces, which uh, for example, was like weights and measures, like kilograms and how things are standardized. Because the whole country was unified as one, he was able to spread that equally. Now his mausoleum, the same like mound that we saw in the last episode, is not here. He's not buried here. His, his mausoleum is about like two and a half kilometers away from here. This was sort of hidden from history for a long time until it was discovered by a lowly farmer digging, digging for water. And oh boy, what did he discover? What do you think of this? It's pretty impressive, isn't it? <laughs> right? It really is, yeah. I mean, this is no joke, and this is just one of the pits, yeah. you know? So some of the cool things right here, back here is the well. This is this is where the farmer was digging, and actually came upon the the this whole amazing monstrosity. Now, if he was digging just one meter farther this way, he would have completely missed this whole complex, and it might still be hidden to date. Now, there's also an area back here that's sort of like a pit and it's got solid sides, and it looks very alien in this place. It looks like it's not supposed to be here because this place used to be farmland, and people used to die, and they used to dig tombs and put people in, in, the, in the ground, just like, you know, we do today, not, not so long ago. And so somebody dug a pit there, excavated the whole area out, created a tomb for their family, friend, and then buried him there. 
The funny thing is that he had to move a bunch of the, the debris, so he was probably digging through this thing, moving midsections and torsos and heads and all of this stuff to the side, and he buried his friend or family in a situation where he was surrounded by one of the most amazing armies in the world. So, kind of an interesting thought, right? So this emperor, who was the man who unified China with some of the most interesting uh, 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 finances and leadership skills in order to build this amazing, truly unique army made out of stone with sweat and labor from hundreds if not thousands of people all working together to create this amazing place and who is residing within it a local farmer <laughs> i mean that I, I bet that that local farmer if there is a place beyond was really appreciative of the amazing place that was built for him to die and lay in his final resting place <laughs> crazy now I came here uh, many years ago with Annie and I walked along that other side and I remember I was so excited about coming here. I was, it was hard. I was listening to what the interpreter was saying and I was sucking it all in and repeating it. It's a great episode actually. I, I might have to watch it to compare my performance today and, and, and my performance then. But um, this is one of those places that just is amazing. And if you look at these characters, each one is different. Every single one has a different feeling a different artist, a lot of them. They have different hats, different hairstyles, different facial expressions. The emperor wanted each one of these terracotta warriors to be unique, special, because they were gonna be the ones that were gonna take care of him and be his buddies in the great beyond. In a lot of cases, you have situations where there's horses, there's chariots, there's archers, there's soldiers, there's generals, and then there's the pawns the ordinary military uh, cohorts that you have in, in any sort of army. The horses were particularly important because in the afterlife, he needed really good quality horses and steeds to take him and inspect his, uh, his land after he was dead. He was under the assumption that even in the afterlife, he was gonna be taking care of his country. He was gonna be, you know, leading from the great beyond. This pit right here is, uh, is interesting because underneath it lies the terracotta soldiers. Um, and they, they know what's underneath it because they've used sonic imaging to, to read what's beneath the surface. They know it's there, but they're a bit afraid to exhume everything. Because in a lot of cases, these were extremely beautiful and ornately decorated. We'll see it in the museum later where they have pictures and representations of what it used to look like. And once the oxygen is reaching the, the stone, it starts to become bland and, and sort of bleached. So they're keeping some of these six sections buried because they wanna make sure that when they do exhume them, they have the technology to preserve them in a way that might be able to retain some of that. Because right now, a lot of that unique texture and new unique color is, is lost almost immediately. I mean, the atmosphere that we live in is very harsh to such delicate artistry as has been buried for such a long time. You know, it's, it's a little bit sad that this whole area has been covered up and hidden for so long until just 1973. But it's also sort of like a blessing in disguise because people didn't like to have this here, especially the people right after um, he was buried and he died because it was sort of a symbol of his power. And so emperors that are subsequent to him actually did try to come here and like destroy this place. But over time, history sort of covered it up and it sort of disappeared from the face of time, basically. And almost, it was a welcome thing because it preserved it so that when we were, when we were ready to experience it and preserve it, uh, it came out and now we're actually taking efforts to keep it the way it was. But probably if it came out in the, in, in, in the period of time after the death of the emperor and it was completely discovered at that period of time, it would have probably been completely destroyed and leveled and we would, we would certainly not be seeing what we see today. So it's kind of thankful that the, it was lost to time, you know. 
so that it could be discovered today. Man, that must be such a big job, right? So. Oh, it's gotta be so fun though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. When you find the missing piece and you're like, yes, <laughs> let's get this on here. It's like you could say this is the world's hardest puzzle. <laughs> well, I wonder if she knows the artist, you know, because each each sculptor, there was like hundreds of them, right? Yeah. You know, and each one had their batch. Yeah. And I wonder if she like, I mean, I don't know if you know them by name, but she must know like probably, I wonder if she gives them names. Oh, this is Frank's. Oh, this is the, another one of Frank's. Oh, look at that. You could tell by the eyes. This is, yeah, this is Cynthia. Yeah. This is Cynthia, yeah, you yeah. know? Like, I wonder, because each one of these characters have their own personality, and I'm yeah. sure that their own personalities are also encapsulated in the different designs, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, so, yeah. like, okay, I know this eye from this guy, right, and I know right. this hairstyle because this guy really liked these hairstyles. And if anybody knew that, yeah, exactly. Be I was about girl. to say, they're doing this as like, uh, you know, uh, probably a career for yeah. a long, long time. So they probably do get to know a lot about, you know, the, the small details of each warrior. The so you're probably ones. onto something there. I really? didn't think of that. Really? I didn't think of that. I wonder who she's doing. I wonder if Frank made that. <laughs> <laughs> for a split second, I thought that one back there had a big gulp. Had a coffee. Starbucks <laughs> coffee. Look, look, look at that guy yeah, back it there. It looks like, like he has a the, Starbucks coffee in his hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cling film. <laughs> I used to like to do puzzles with my dad. My dad really enjoyed making puzzles, especially just before he passed on. We, 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 were, we were making puzzles together. It was kind of how we bonded for a little while. And uh, I remember the joy it, that I felt when I found a piece that matched up perfectly with the other pieces. And it's got to be sort of the same way here, only you're an archaeologist and you're like, this, this slot A goes into, into peg B and we're good to go. We finished, you know, we finished. The ultimate puzzle. There's a couple of pieces still missing on that guy. This area sort of looks like a field hospital. There's a gurney, a bunch of like dentist tables with lights over it. I mean, obviously they're picking very, very minute rocks and, and, and trying to clean off very, very minute uh, pieces of each warrior, but it's, it's kind, of, kind of funny. Looks like a little hospital. What's his problem? He's been dead for 2,000 years. These lines of, of, of terracotta warriors actually have large uh, walkways down the center. We, we, it's hard for me to do this. The camera's opposite. Anyways, uh, this area here is where like the prestigious people go. So like you have Obama has been here, and I think Bill Clinton was here, and then obviously Xi Jinping. And when they come here, they're not necessarily allowed down in the pits with all the the actual soldiers that are still standing in stasis, but they walk along here and there's a bunch of, bunch of Hollywood, Hollywood uh, actors and stuff that come down here and do their photo ops. This pit is my favorite out of all the areas. There's a museum and a couple of other sections. Uh, the other one that we'll see has more deep trenches and this is just one big huge open field basically where the army is awaiting their, their orders from the big boss man. <sighs> They've been waiting a long time. Time to go. Now, if you look at the ceilings, you can see how they're kind of got these like divots in them. The reason that, that that was that way is because there were ceilings over all of these pits. So each trench had a ceiling made of, um, made of wooden beams. And so the wooden beam indentations are what you see over each of the walls that separate each of the trenches. Now this place uh, used to have a, a bit more. Obviously the color has faded out of each of these characters and some of the features have dulled and obviously the ceilings have been removed to do the excavation. But there used to be wood here too. The chariots actually had wooden wheels and wooden components. Some of the soldiers actually had wooden spears, but over time, obviously, those things rotted away. I, I'm so interested by all of this because the amount of work that went into this exceeds some of the work people <laughs> used to build their own homes. And this was built for somebody that, that was, was gone, is dead, you know? It's so incredible. The floors in between each of these trenches, they pile-drived the ground until it was solid. 45 centimeters deep. Then they tiled over that floor and then started laying in all the terracotta warriors. You know one of the most interesting things I think about is, is I try to close my eyes and I take myself all the way back to when there were just these corridors. And look at, look at how tightly these guys are laid in. You had to have uh, the artists like, they probably go all the way to the end and then start building and building and building and building and building the soldiers little by little. And then all the way to the front, 
it was very, very dark, probably, with, with you know, lit torches and whatnot. And they're laying them in and painting them and laying them in and painting them. And they knew that the moment they laid the next one in, they were probably never going to see the one that was behind it and behind that and behind that. So all of your work was going to be encapsulated. You're never going to be able to show anybody. I mean, think about that. All of that work, and then you're putting wooden beams over and they're gone. They're gone. You're never going to see them again. Golly, artists today, you guys really got to appreciate the fact that you put your stuff in the museum. People all over the world can appreciate it. I wonder if they thought maybe someday this place is going to be open and people like me were going to come and appreciate their work thousands of years down the road. Obviously, uh, the artists had inspiration to make these. I wonder if a lot of these were based on brothers, fathers, uncles, you know, specific people. I wonder if they designed them with emotions in mind. Like, this guy was, you know, was a very confident man. This man had kids. This soldier, you know, felt this way or that way. I, I gotta imagine, in order to try and create such unique sculptures and such unique expressions, you had to think deeply about each character. I mean, you must have had to work on these for, I don't know, weeks or months at a time to get each one unique and finished. So what sort of attitude did you infuse into every character? What sort of emotions did each of those characters carry? What were their hopes? <laughs> I know their hopes were to take care of the emperor, but you know what I mean by that, you know? <laughs> really, really amazing. All right, that's finished with pit number one. Now we're going to the next one, pit number three. And then we're gonna go to pit number two, and then the museum. All right, so this is pit number three. Now, this is not as, as um, broad, as, as just epic size-wise, as the first pit. The first pit is my favorite. You know, one of the <laughs> side benefits of being here in the time of COVID is that it's a little bit more open here. I remember when I came here with Annie, it was packed and this place is normally very, very packed. So you can kind of take some time and get a little bit more intimate with the, uh, with the displays and the exhibits. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the items, especially from this area, were relocated to the museum. So it's, it's a bit more destroyed. There, uh, there was some more ruins here, ruinous. Now, a lot of the terracotta warriors in the main pit were fragmented and put back together. But in this area, um, they, were, they were more moved and they were reassembled in the museum area. The uh, highlight to this pit in particular, though, is the chariot. And so you had the chariot here with the four horses that are right down here. Now, the, the chariot and the, and the wooden components of the chariot and some of the accessories have decayed and they're no longer there. But the horses are still there. My name in Chinese is Ma Te. Uh, Ma means horse and Te means uh, Te Biata. Te Biata and special. So Te is special. So uh, these are four of my uh, namesakes. Special horses. Four special horses. If you are a true tourist like, like me and Annie were when we came here a while back, uh, this is the place where you take that obligatory picture where it looks like you're standing amongst all of the... Uh, all of the characters. I already have one, so there's no need to take another. But yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to look like you're standing amongst all of the terracotta soldiers, this is the place where you take that that tourist shot. Just like that. So you can see why that first pit was my, my favorite. This one's not very impressive. We're going to the third pit now, and I'm walking along a road that just joins the two pits together. Today, it's paved with tile and has some park benches and things like this but there was a time when just workers were going back and forth with big wheelbarrows they were dragging stones back and forth painters and carpenters and stone workers and just every manner of artist was transporting having lunch out here you know hey joe you have a long day did you finish your guy today no, nah, no, nah, I've got a few more days at it. Let's go grab lunch together. And so they come out here and this, I mean, think about it. Think about it. This area was probably full of uh, uh, vendors selling food and all sorts of things from the farmland, bringing it up here, trying to make sure that everybody, all the workers were happy because this place was hustling and bustling with people 
for years and years. This thing took forever to make. And you know, we go inside and we see the pits, but sometimes you gotta appreciate the life that was lived around the pits. I mean, you had to have an entire society fed, happy, well, well kept in order to have them really producing the finest work as possible and, and making that really positive effort to make sure that the emperor's terracotta army was in tip-top shape. So this is pit number two, and the reason why, it, it's my second favorite pit. <laughs> it's my second favorite pit. The reason why it's not the first is because I can't see the warriors, but it's the reason why it's not the last is because you can use your imagination. This pit is largely still covered. You can see where the beams used to support the ceiling. So in between this area is a column, in between this area is a column trench where there's warriors, horses, archers, just every manner of sort of figurine is, is kept within this area. And they're not going to uncover it until they're good and ready to do so. So it's, there's a lot of potential in this, in this room what lies beneath these trenches? I'm sure that scientifically, there's a lot, a lot of ways to read what's, what's beneath there. And there's probably some people with, with some sonic devices that have been able to read some of the shapes and figurines that are beneath there. But besides that, just maybe that area and a couple more that have been excavated, the rest are waiting until they can figure out the best way to preserve whatever is buried underneath. I think in itself, it's kind of interesting. I mean, obviously I want to see what's under there, but to wonder is its own, uh, is its own thing too, you know. So here you can actually see the layout of what they know is there. These are rows of soldiers. These are horses, more horses and chariots. This whole thing basically is horses and chariots. So you can see those are the chariots. And then there's four horses and there's just rows upon rows upon rows upon rows. Pretty incredible. I like to think about the things that most people don't think about. For example, getting to the job site. Now, this pit is way, way below ground. Obviously you could have ladders, but there's a lot of weight in all of these warriors, all of the stonework and everything. But here is one of the ramps. So you'd come down this ramp and then you'd enter this area of columns. And it makes me think, I wonder when, when they started work. Did they work through the night? Was it the torchlight work? Was it like six in the morning, you know, somebody rung a big bell, get up, let's go. You know, some guy having his morning rice porridge, you know, tells his wife, I'll be back at the end of the day, probably very long days. And then they would file in, you know, and then they would all have their work. They'd all know what to do. You know, some of them would go up this way, other ones would go up this way, and then they would walk up these these trenches. Where in yeah, you know, obviously in the day these were actually open, and uh, you could walk in. And the, I don't know if they had the roofs on. I, I wonder if they had the roofs off until they finished all of the warriors, and then they laid the pylons over, and then they buried everything. It'd be very interesting to find out the process of what happened. Uh, have a time machine come back here and then uh, get a job on the job site just for fun you know <laughs> there's a funny thing that when you travel there's a type of traveling called woofing and uh, I forget what the acronym is for but basically you're working on farms around the world so you can you can stop at a place and you can work for a week or a month at a farm you provide them a service for their farm and then they provide you some room and board and that's kind of how a lot of people travel. A lot of people travel around the world uh, wolfing it. And uh, it would be funny to come back here as a time machine and, and wolf it on the Terracotta Army for, for, a, few, uh, for a few months. The, the problem is that they're probably pretty much enslaved. So if you were to wolf it for a little while, you'd probably be wolfing it for a real long while. <laughs> you'd, end up, you'd end up being part of the crew. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Just think about the life of a worker. This is a really cool section, sort of chronicling the different nuance between each, 
each terracotta warrior from the hairstyle, the way the bun on the top of the head was positioned, the expression or the distinct nature of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the face paint. You know, who is this based on? What sort of a person <laughs> was, was the inspiration for all of these different characters? And there's so many, thousands of them. And each one was truly unique to, to its neighbor. All just an incredible uh, museum full of unique, unique designs. Look at all these mouths. Every single one different. I like this guy, he's got a Fu Manchu. Okay, so this is the museum. This is a place where they take some of the most preserved elements of the Terracotta Warriors and they show them to us. Unfortunately, a lot of the museum is closed. They're closing right now. So there's not a lot I can show you, but uh, the chari some of the chariot replicas are here. Um, I actually really wish I could show you some of the colorful uh, elements. Maybe I'll dig into some of my old footage of when I was younger. I was a younger fella and show you some of the, some of the shots I shot back in the day because I, I found them really, really interesting. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pass this section on to, to a younger Matt and he can go ahead and show you some of the interesting components here for the Warriors. These are the horses and they're interesting because there's no stirrups. There's no way to get on the horse. So way back in the day, they didn't even have that invented yet. They had Mongolians to take care of the horses. So they actually had these tall guys that could get up on these horses. So did you learn a little bit? Finally. So yesterday you asked me. I said, I don't know. That's why we need to go there and figure it out. So if you have time and you're in Xi'an, you should go and see the terracotta soldiers. I'm glad I went. It's kind of cool. <laughs> okay guys. So there were the terracotta warriors. One of my favorite visits in all of China. Just a, just a really, really interesting mystery uncovered and explored. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to follow me on my journey as I travel around, well, at this point in time, China, and uh, hopefully the world when things start chilling out a little bit, you can subscribe to my channel. I have a Patreon where I do audio podcasts. You can listen to me tell stories uh, as, I, as I do my travels, maybe a little bit more intimate stories, more intimate about life and, and my journey and everything. Um, uh, just join social media, like, subscribe, share, comment, all that fun stuff. And, uh, geez, I wonder what's next. Good morning, ladies and germs. See, I, I, I'm, I'm top shield today because I've got my China red on. Yeah, I'm going to be up on stage here <laughs> talking. Shield. They're all entrepreneurs, you know? They're all doing different things and, and, and they're proud of their, their talent. <laughs> Two months to weave out of bamboo. If you look really, really close, you can see, oh my god, the weaving inside is really intricate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>